Alright. Welcome to the next part of this session. We're talking about the engagement model of problem solving. Alright, so in this session we're going to talk a little bit about the traditional model again, which I keep hammering on about. Now in previous sessions, we've talked about how the traditional model offers very little comfort for those involved in actual problem solving. All this does really is tell you what the process should look like from a helicopter view. Well, what we're interested in this course, at least, is understanding how what the process looks like from the everyday view. How does it work every day? Why do we want to know that? Well, we want to know that because uh, how does it actually work? You're going to be managers. How does it actually work? All right, so the engagement model is based on a very simple concept that people engage with the world through the, their ideas, what they think things to be rather than the way things actually are. Now, there are some things that I'm not going to engage in the conversation here, like the economy, um, the sunshine, the planet, climate change. I don't want to get into those debates. I'm not qualified to talk about those things. But what I can tell you about is that um, there's this theory called cognitive dissonance theory. And the idea is that people naturally find gaps in what they experience. Now, cognitive dissonance can be explained, I'm sure you've heard this term in your degree already, can be explained as the difference between what you see and what actually happens. Um, really, another way of saying it would be cognitive dissonance is the difference between your expectations and reality. So, there's this joke, you know, that you, you um, see things the way you want to see them rather than the way they actually are. Well, the way they actually are is what we're talking about in this session. This first part is, is quite tough, so you're going to have to follow me on this. It's based on the concept of sense making. In other words, that human beings and the way that their minds are wired up look for patterns. Patterns may or may not exist. And there's a lot of research going on in the neuropsychology and neurophysiology areas, which is suggesting that the brain is actually quite plastic and flexible. Now, if it's flexible, it can be based on the expectations of what I have and the mismatches between what we want and what actually happens. So where I've got on the slides there, based on the expectations and mismatches between what we desire and what we expect, another way of saying that could be, look, the engagement model is all about understanding how there's different expectations of what the problem is. People have different desires and uh, people have different interests which they, that, which they bring to the table when we go to solve problems. Now when we look at this, we look at the expectations and mismatches, we're talking about cognitive dissonance. So in other words, I might see something that happens, right? So I'm going home, it's a long day at work. I expect my wife to be happy to see me when she gets back. She's cranky. That's a mismatch, mismatch expectation. Uh, I might come to work and expect the meetings are going to go smoothly, but it doesn't happen that way. It's because the things which we don't expect end up being the things that cause us to fail at problem solving. Why? Because everybody has different expectations. Everybody has a different perspective on what the problem might be. Does this mean we slide into the world of extreme subjectivity and there are no truths or anything like that? Absolutely not. But what it means is everybody has a different opinion, Everybody has a different history, cultural history. Uh, everybody has a different background that they're working on. They have a different, what we call ontology, or understanding of what it means to exist. They have a different um, concept of life. And, uh, you know, let's take four different people. Any four different people have different expectations of life. If you're like me and you're from a, a Bogan background, then there are certain things built into your mind that will never change, not without some work. Uh, if you're from a high society background, then there are certain expectations in there, certain desires, certain interests that uh, are there and emotionally or psychologically can't be shifted or changed. Not without a lot of work. Now, why is that? Well, I don't know why that is, but you're, the way that you, in, you build your value systems, the way in which you engage with the world, I think a better way of um, saying it would be the way that you relate to the world is how you'll end up solving those problems. Why? Because those underlying expectations, those assumptions, those beliefs, uh, the frames through which you look at the windows of the world, the ideas, the concepts, the solutions, all come from who you are as a person. Now, um, there's some very interesting research coming out um, of this university and a few other places where they look at the neuropsychological aspects of it, saying that, well, when we have certain expectations, we receive certain results. Your mind can be programmed to think in a way in which it expects good things to happen and, you, and your, your beliefs will switch and look for those good things. There's different ways of, of saying that. 
Some people might classify life as a struggle, for example. Some people might classify life as awesome. Some people might classify life as a complete waste of time. So you have all these different ways that people engage with the world. And that's why I called it the engagement model. It's based on some work that a former supervisor of mine was doing. And he was looking at the ways in which to engage problems through a methodology called soft systems methodology. I took those ideas and I decided to simplify them and create a process which I call the engagement model. It's very helpful and I'm going to give you the shorthand version of it in this session. So how does it work? Well, look at the pathway of any problem. Learn steps. What are the steps people take to solve problems? It begins with the mind. It begins with the frame or the window through which you look at the problem at. It is, these perceptions try and shift the way we think about problems. So if we look at the pathway, uh, the steps in which the problems take place, we look at the perceptions, we look at what it is, and we think about what it is, we experience what we call a gap. Now, a problem is the gap, or the mismatched expectation between what I see and what actually is happening. I don't perceive a problem where none exists, right? No. Think the opposite way. People perceive problems. Problems will never exist without people. Now, I'm not talking about nature, like I said earlier. Because nature is a real, you know what, in this situation. Nature throws problems at us. Let's take a classic example, changing a car tire. Let's imagine you're on a road, you're driving along, and boom, your tire goes out. You hop out. Your immediate problem is now that the tire is flat. You're a person. You have the problem because you perceive it, right? To some people, a flat tire might be a solution. I don't know. might be, okay, good, I can finally get rid of this bloody car. I'm just going to catch a taxi from this point. I get out. I've got to change the tire. I change the tire, get out the wheel jack and all that stuff, and I, and I change the tire. I'm coming around the other side of the car, and I see a truck coming. That truck hits me and kills me. All of a sudden, I have a different problem, right? So where, wherever I'm at in life, I'm a person, I have problems. There are no problems that aren't people problems. So let's just try and establish that. You will not get this. I will bet each one of you one cupcake by the end of semester that none of you will understand this thoroughly. Why? Because we, in our English language system, have what they call reified the idea of a problem. You have to, you, you, there's no such thing as a problem where there are no people. If tomorrow I got a nuclear bomb that was going to detonate the entire world and I smashed that red button and I obliterated the whole world and I destroyed it and I created absolute chaos and everybody was dead, there would be no more problems. I just paused for effect there, but anyway, that's <laughs> the idea. So the idea uh, of this model is quite simple. It shifts it from the problem being some external objective thing to being about people in an organization. What do people think? That's what the problem is. What does it look like? Well, first of all, we begin with understanding what the concept of the problem is. We look at the landscape. What are the current concepts that people use to explain the problem? Have a look at any point of view modeling. And I'll put up a couple of videos on uh, point of views. Uh, and I'm working on this at the moment, po modeling point of views in problem situations. Excuse me. <coughs> I was breathing out. Okay, the concept is the framework that people use to um, assess the problem. So when we look at the concept, we ask ourselves, what is the concept of the problem currently lives within? What is the concept? Well, we don't know what the concept is. What is it? Find out. Don't identify the problem. Look at the concepts or ideas that people are using to assess the problem. So this takes a step back from just leaping into bed with identification. It takes a step back and says, let's take, let's take identification out to dinner. Let's buy it a drink. Let's take it a nightclub before we take it to bed. Right? It, there's a process involved here. There's a, there's a few steps. We have to really meditate on that problem, like I said in the last session. Now, here's the trick. How is it expressed? Well, what are the alternative explanations? Problem expressions are the alternative explanations. How does it diverge? How does one person's opinion of it differ from another? And there will be more than one concept. If there's only one concept, you haven't asked enough people, or you're looking at it through a blind mindset. You're blinded. Oh, but it did only happen one way. Okay, in truth, a car accident only ever happens one way. But when you look at the events and you talk to people, they'll give you two different expressions of what they think the problem is. Oh, this idiot pulled out on me. Yeah, but you were driving too slow. And there's different expressions. The police officer or the courts then have to judge which one of these alternative expression, expressions has the most veracity or which one is the, which one is the truest. 
Um, we call this the dialectic. So the dialectic is a philosophical word, and it means to look at something through opposing views. It is not synthesis. So if you Google this word, you'll get an incorrect assumption of the original philosophical intent of this word. The dialectic is quite simple. It's the idea brought up by a theologian on how two things can be true at the same time. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the truth operates according to different levels of understanding. So if I'm beginning out as a tradesperson, I begin out, I begin with the basic skills, and as I go along, especially as a manager, I learn different skills and I understand the art of something. I understand the conflicts in something. Dialectic is nothing more than something that has two possibilities attached to it, or opposing views, and they are in conflict with each other. The philosopher Hegel came up with this idea called the superconcept, and the idea is that there are these concepts that dissolve tensions. So I can look at a conflict and I can say, instead of taking one view or the other, I can take a third view and I can dissolve this tension and get rid of this problem altogether. The scholar Russell Akoff came up with a bottom-up approach to that. He said that you can look at the conflict, you can go back to the roots of the problem and completely reorganize the system from the bottom up and change the, the perceptions of the problem and then you change the outcome. Now all he did is social engineering, right? And that's the funny thing. In social engineering, the dialectic or the view is that there is one better concept out there that gets rid of these problems. Now, where, where the dialectic stuff has fallen over in philosophy, and this is really not of interest to you, it's become about conflict. It's not about conflict. It's about how an idea can be complex enough to be true across multiple domains at once. Think about it. The housing crisis. Um, the global financial crisis. There are a lot of layers of truth in there. There are a lot of different things that happen. Think of your own life. Just say you, you had a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you went out with them and it became impossible to live with that person. Now, if I was to sit you down and say, why was it impossible to live with that person? Didn't you love them? Oh, yes, I loved them, but I hated them. You can love someone and hate them at the same time, right? It's possible. You can have a connection with someone and want to get away from them. There's... This is life. Life is about conflict and opposing views all the time. This is realistic, the realistic way it happens. Now, if you go into an organization or you're working for someone, do this where you work right now. Find a problem and then find someone else who has an opposite opinion. It won't take you long. What do we do with it, though, is what my model is about. What do we do with that? And I'm indebted to scholars like Peter Checklin, Paul Leddington, Mike Metcalf, and others that have developed this idea and turned it into something more explicit. Um, I took their work and I created this, this simplified, shortcut, heuristic model. All right, so then we learn our way through the problem after that. And um, I'll explain how that works. So in summary, how do, what, does the, what does the model look like? Well, we begin with the working concept of the problem or a conjecture. We say, here is what I think the concept of the problem is. How is it expressed? Well, these are what people are saying. These are the alternative views that I've found. And these are the conflicts that I've got. Now, the next part, is the fun part. How do we dissolve those conflicts? How do we get rid of those conflicts? How do we map out the tensions across the domain of the problem and find ways to dissolve them? And that's coming up later on in the semester. This is the way it looks. And uh, I'll get to that new interpretations. In the new, this is the old model. I haven't drawn up the new model yet. The idea is quite simple, that you have a conceptual frame or a framework, a set of ideas in which the problem lives in. Now, because this problem lives in one idea, and um, often people don't consider others, they don't look at the expressions of the problem. So let's go back. Expressions are alternative explanations. So let's just say I have this working definition of a problem. If I'm really going to engage with it, I have to engage with the dialectical processes within the problem. So I have to look at the concept. I have to look at the series of steps involved. I have to look at all the different people and the different opinions and understand completely what, what are the areas of conflict and where do I need to dissolve that conflict in order to come to a, a, a new interpretation of the problem that works. In shorthand, this is the simplest way that it works. I take an idea, okay, or I take a problem, let's say. I explore all the different ways people are expressing the possible solutions. I then, ex I then explore how these solutions are in conflict with, with e each other and I look for a super concept or I look for a new interpretation that completely reorganizes the expressions of a problem into a workable solution for everybody. Is this compromise? No. Is it accommodation? No. So in other words, am I accommodating people, trying to get everyone to agree? 
I'm talking about a completely new concept that eradicates all the old expressions of the problem, gets rid of all of these dialectical processes, and creates a new set of assumptions for people to work with. Now, this is difficult, but this is the reality of what needs to happen in modern management. Okay, so again, just in summary, this model looks at the conceptual frame of the problem, where it is at the moment, that interacts with the current expressions of the problem and creates conflict. So I might be looking at our sales downturn example from the previous session. Sales have gone down. Now everyone's going to have an opinion on why those sales have gone down. I then compare those opinions, I look at all the comparisons, and I compare the different expressions of the problem, and I try and get to a place where a new concept emerges that absolves or dissolves all of those old concepts into one new framework. Now, I'll give you some examples of that shortly. Uh, a little bit more on the model first. Uh, assumptions. All problems are inherently concepts. People are, as I said earlier, um, all problems are people problems. If you change the concept that you use to study a problem, you change the way that it's framed, or the way in which people look through it, you change any possible answers, and all problems are ideas. Ideas can change. Problems can change depending on our engagement pathway with them. Every problem we engage with, our ideas are engaged in that problem. What we need to learn to do is look at alternative possible engagements and compare them with our own and look for ways to dissolve the connections and the tensions that exist in our own ideas with these others and come up with better concepts or new ideas. Um, my whole research is based on this. The best example I've seen was of an elevator in Philadelphia. They were built this beautiful new tenement building and um, what happened was the residents in the building were complaining the elevator was too slow. So it's got six floors. It's going from the top to the bottom. And it's too slow coming down, too slow going out. And they got all these complaints. So they, they got four different groups of people together. They got engineers, they got social scientists, they got operations management people, people that look at uh, us, you know, how to make things go faster and better. And they got... Um, some university students. Now the engineer came up with the idea to solve the problem. Now what did he do? Well he looked at it and they said, well we, we could replace the elevator. It's going to cost another couple of million dollars. We can get a faster one. We can put in better hydraulics and they can go up and down. The social science says, well people don't like to wait. So you can do all these different things. But the problem is they don't want to wait. The other groups basically came up with similar solutions like optimizing the elevator waiting times, make it go faster, make it go quicker. Make it happen in a way that uh, people can clearly understand what's going on with the, the patterns and the engagement with the problem that way. And so on and so forth. So, when we look at it that way, it becomes a little bit more tricky. It becomes a little bit more complex. And the solution was to put a mirror in down the bottom of the elevator so people were forced to look at themselves while they waited. Now, the engineer came up with that solution based on what the social sciences people said, that it, it, it basically, they didn't want to wait. And because they didn't want to wait, what happened was people would see themselves waiting and become self-conscious, and they stopped complaining about waiting. Now, that seems like a really silly solution, but think about it. It solved the problem. It was a cheap and inexpensive solution. What they did is they stepped out of the existing concept, and they found a bigger concept, that took all of those smaller concepts together and just dissolved them into a better answer. This is lateral thinking, but it's a little bit more than that. As the semester goes on, if you learn this one skill, you'll be very successful in all of your management endeavours. Examples. Alright, if you navigate to the wiki and read Conjecture First Problem Solving for this week, that will finish this session. And in class, we're going to do some problem-dissolving exercises, and they will be posted soon if not later.